Hello. Thank you for coming, everybody. Yes, that's me, right there, six years old. Uh, this newly redecorated community center really looks great. And without the help of many people here, I, I wouldn't be able to do this. And so first off, I'd like to thank some of the people involved. Um, Jennifer Lyons runs this show. Terry back there in the back. To, um, Kathleen and Bill. Um, the facilities guy got this all set up. So thanks to them. My girlfriend and partner, Lisa DeLuca, is my tech guru and helped me edit. <laughs> Along with my mom here, Phyllis Straka, my dad, Tim Yoder, my stepmother, Ramona Yoder, my uncle, my aunt, my brother, my niece, my nephew, it goes on. Um, also, Trent Heidke back there in the back is doing the technical filming. And last but not least, Brent and Alan Crookshank let me use two of their photos uh, today. So thanks to them. Um, so why did I write this? <clears throat> This is an origin story, and it hopes to raise and satisfy curiosity. In, the way, in that way, it is also the story of an American boy coming of age in a modern boom town. While this should add to the historical record of the town, it is a perspective of Fountain Hills history through the memories and reflections of a young member of an early founding fam family. The emphasis is on my memories, so it is by no means a comprehensive retelling of the way it was. It's more like the way my life was. Coming of age during the ascendance of this unincorporated county area from a few residents to over 6,000 residents in a brief 12-year span makes this an uncommon account, I hope. To my knowledge, there's no similar story. That said, there are at least two more purposes behind this telling. In 20 years as a teacher, I recognized growing fear and passivity in great numbers of young people. It's my hope that this record will reflect the opposite of fear and passivity, that it might furnish a lesson promoting risk-taking and independence, <laughs> productivity and work, commitment and responsibility. For me, those factors created a childhood and youth which led to a life of meaningful activity and pleasant memories. This is also the first chapter of my memoir, which highlights the aforementioned themes and stories of my life, my career, and my research. So with that, I'd like to get started on this public reading. <clears throat> My brother and I were accessories to our parents' hopes and dreams. All kids are accessories to their parents' dreams, one might argue, but our story had a different dynamic in that the dream and the actions taken to fulfill it were transformative, figuratively and literally transformative. Our parents' dream was to move to a brand new county area cut from the desert dirt and rock of Arizona's Sonoran Desert and to build it into a town. <clears throat> it would take everything they had to grow their custom home construction company. That was in the summer of 1973. The area was bursting with about 300 residents, man, woman, and child. <clears throat> in summer of 1973, the resident with the longest tenure in Fountain Hills may have been living here for 12 months or 18 months. Fountain Hills was truly a new concept. The town was officially incorporated 16 years later. For the Yoders, realizing the dream was an enormous gamble. The move. I was six and ready to begin first grade when we arrived. We moved into the left half of a duplex on Fountain Hills Boulevard near the intersection of Saguaro Boulevard. Fountain Hills Boulevard was paved for about a quarter of a mile, basically linking Oxford Drive to Fayette Drive. 
Mom took care of my little brother Jason and me. Dad began working as a carpenter building homes. There was no schoolhouse within 15 miles. Freedom and independence immediately permeated the social and cultural energy of the area. It was how we children played freely, and independence and optimism was in the air that we breathed. We played in and around the carport outside and ran shoeless in the desert dirt near the new duplex we were renting. In a few weeks before school began, and certainly in the weeks and years that followed, Dad was very busy working with his brother, Uncle Glenn, and Father Fred, <clears throat> and their new partner, a Mesa, Arizona contractor named Reed Jewett, who you see here. Reed's on the left, my grandfather was on the right. This is the 1973 Yoder family group, investment group, that started the business. Though oblivious to the family's professional activities and motivations at the time, we know now that Grandfather Fred and his two sons abandoned their previous established and comfortable lives and moved to Fountain Hills to start building houses. None of them had been involved in home building. Life had been good for all concerned. During my first grade year, Yoder Jewett finished our house on Fountain Hills Boulevard across the street from the duplex we lived in. Here's that early Yoder Jewett home and a view from the front yard looking south in a minute. My six-year-old friend lived in the house in the background on Fairland Drive over there on the far left, and the car next to our home was my grandmother's Mercury Cougar. This next shot is looking from our front yard out towards the fountain. And uh, I remember having a BB gun wrist rocket fight with some friends at that house there in the middle ground. But early education. A single school bus with about 25 Fountain Hills children took us to Mesa's Irving School on Center Street next to what is today the Mesa Convention Center. Two other kids from Fountain Hills were in my first grade class. In the 45 minute bus trip, it was not uncommon for us to fall asleep on the way to school and back. Some of the other kids on the bus were much older than me, fifth and sixth graders. They taught me cuss words. <laughs> but Mrs. Reeder on the left taught me phonics and how to read. I grew up being told that she'd won Teacher of the Year for Mesa Unified or the State of Arizona. Singing the ABCs to their phonetic sounds, shaking and dancing in a circle to R&B or funk music, playing on Mrs. Reader's record player is a lasting memory. Mom and Dad divorced the summer after first grade. Second grade began in an empty office strip on Colony Drive in Fountain Hills. We had a school. Ms. Phipps was my new teacher. After Christmas, the brand new Fountain Hills Elementary School opened up and classes were transferred there. There were over 100 kids in the K-8 school by the end of that school year. A small group of Yavapai students from the neighboring Fort McDowell Indian Reservation joined in our schooling. Early in second grade, I wasn't doing too well in school, a result, no doubt, of disturbance from dad and mom's divorce. Dad went in to a parent-teacher conference with Miss Phipps. <laughs> Lo and behold, a few weeks before school ended that year, Miss Phipps became Mrs. Yoder when she and Dad were married. Here they are on that day. Although freedom and independence were the overarching energy of the new town and its roughly 500 residents, my school life, my educational world, was changed forever. Because my new stepmother worked at the school with 12 other teachers, all of my future teachers, nothing I would do that was behaviorally outstanding would ever go unnoticed or unreported. <laughs> Stepmom Ramona might hear a report about me from another teacher, and that evening dad, in his own way, had something to tell me about it. I quickly learned that there'd be no anonymity for me in our small outpost village. I became more responsible, especially in the realm of behavior and academics. Dad and Ramona had a son in 1979. Our half-brother, Matt, was born in Scottsdale. Adding to the growing realization that we were becoming known members of a small community, Mom began to work as a teller at Southwest Savings and Loan. It was one of only two banks in Fountain Hills. 
She would come to know hundreds of residents and workers. Jason and I were losing anonymity on both sides. <laughs> in an effort to keep this presentation about an hour in length, we will skip some of my earliest memories of playing with rocks and cacti, some problems emanating therefrom, our pets and run-ins with javelina, coyote, rattlesnakes, skunks, and tortoise. However, there is one photograph Dad took that I've always enjoyed, this red-tailed hawk and me in sixth grade. Dad found it injured on the side of the road. We kept the bird in our darkened laundry room and fed it liver for a couple of days until Arizona Game and Fish could come pick it up. Early community development, sports, and play. As we aged into second grade and fourth grade respectively, the parents in town had organized some basic resources for kids like Jason and me. Of course, the population had continued to slowly grow, thereby necessitating more and more social services and activities. Early churches had been established. The school, too, and its grounds housing a baseball field, basketball courts, and a playground were now basically functional. A single wide trailer became the town's library. We even had Bashes, Fountain Hill's first grocery store. The Presbyterian Church held their first meetings on Sundays in Little John's Restaurant, which was a Robin Hood themed bar and restaurant on Saguaro Boulevard. The preacher was a friendly, light hearted Midwesterner named Glenn Atchinson. He sang well, liked to throw clay pots, and gave good sermons. Shortly after starting the church at Little John's, Sunday meetings were held in a rented building near Panorama and Saguaro Boulevard. Mom, Jason, and I attended that church every day on every Sunday for almost 10 years. We sat in the front row and were encouraged to focus on Glenn's sermons through a small form of bribery. If we could recite to Mom a meaningful point that Glenn made after church, we could earn a quarter or 50 cents for candy at Utotem Convenience Store across the street from church. That deal reinforced my listening skills and patience. Glenn officiated Dad and stepmom Ramona's wedding and five years later, he did the same for mom and stepdad, Eddie. He also gave the sermon when Eddie died of cancer a couple of years after that. The preacher was a good guy, and I am indebted to mom and Glenn for my Christian understanding. The families who came to this outpost village in the mid-1970s were the first builders of its institutions and culture. Parents did not have the option to send their kids off to join a team or a group because none existed. Those parents had to make it happen for the sake of their children. Our dad did his part. He arranged for Jason and me to join Y Indian Guides a Cub Scout style group sponsored by the Mesa YMCA, I believe. To my memory, there were about five boys that made up our Fountain Hills group of Y Indian guides. Today, it's unclear what the curriculum was, but this photo shows, shows us at home, uh, shows us at a homemade kite flying competition. A couple of years later, dad made us part of the founding of the Cub Scouts. I, side note, later on, my brother over there became an Eagle Scout. That, that's, that was too many years later. Yeah. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, Dad and two more fathers formed nine or ten of us kids into a Little League team, and with that, Little League Baseball in Fountain Hills was also born. Again, it was part of the City of Mesa's programs for youth. All our games were played in Mesa, and our sponsor was a Mesa insurance business. Before each practice on the field at Fountain Hills Elementary School, it was our job as players on the team to warm up our arms by spending five minutes throwing rocks from the field into the adjacent wash. <laughs> the field at the time was a roughly bladed dirt field which hadn't been manicured for baseball. One stone at a time, we created the first ball field at the school. <laughs> Mr. Losey joined Dad as a coach in our second season. Mr. Losey remains a strong memory because he was a double amputee. To my knowledge, he was a Vietnam War veteran who had lost an arm and a leg over there. He had prosthetics and would limp out to the pincher, pitcher's mound and pitch to us. 
That's Dad on the left, Mr. Losey in the middle, and Mr. Hughes on the right. More than once, our 10-year-old catcher or someone else would timidly lob the ball back to Mr. Losey, who obviously caught barehanded most of the time. He'd sharply instruct the catcher to throw the ball to me. And then the offending softball lobber would have to return the ball with a more direct throw to coach. One time, someone hit a line drive right back at Mr. Losey, and the ball bounced off of one of his plastic-covered wooden prosthetics. He howled at the vibrating arm, which almost sounded like a cartoon springboard on Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner. We didn't laugh. Mr. Losey was tough. He took baseball seriously, and we took him seriously, and I learned to be more deeply humble. In senior leagues, 13 to 16 year olds, my stepfather, Eddie Straka, with Ron Fett on the right, were our coaches. 30 years earlier, Eddie had been drafted into the Cleveland Indians minor league program as a pitcher. He knew baseball well and had coached his son in Ohio Little Leagues two decades earlier. Our Fountain Hills team won the South Scottsdale Little League Championship behind Eddie and Mr. Fett's coaching. It was an incredible achievement for 12 adolescent teens from Fountain Hills, population 3,000. The Fountain Hills Racquet Club was a place to find five tennis courts, a clubhouse, and a large swimming pool. It was opened when I was very young. I'm not sure of the year, but I was taking tennis lessons there in 1976. Other than the old golf course, now called Desert Canyon Golf Course, the racquet club was the only game in town. I enjoyed tennis and was good at it. We spent a lot of time there with Mom after she and Dad divorced. Mom was also good at tennis. I'm not going to talk about my brother Jason. <laughs> no, he was good too. A, pro a promotion was arranged in those early days and former world number one Bobby Riggs came to the club. Alan Cruikshank, the owner of the local paper The Times, took a photo of Bobby, my mom, and her friend Candy Metzger, arm in arm, which hung for quite a time in the River of Time Museum. It was at the racket club where I learned that a schoolmate, a year or two older than me, had been struck on his motorcycle and died. He was riding near the elementary school. My brother's first grade teacher was driving to school and John Turpin accidentally rode out in front of her and Jason's teacher was the one who hit him. It was one of the early tragedies in town. Other play and interests for Jason and me involved practicing sharpshooter skills with BB guns and pellet guns. In the way of freedom, I happily remember being 11 and walking with my pellet gun out the front door, down the street, and into the desert which surrounded us. There was never a thought that anyone would care. We built a racetrack in the yard to race our younger half-brother around in his stroller. We played a racquetball-like game called Jokari, shot hoops in the driveway, and threw baseball. Indoors, we did jigsaw puzzles, played board games, read books, assembled plastic models of World War II aircraft, and watched a little television. Culture and Society. There are several general points which are interesting and useful in understanding the culture of my hometown. Fountain Hills is a Western American town. Actual, real cowboys used to live and work here. Blue-collar tradesmen were the driving engine of the construction of the town. These were not prissy men. They were everywhere. The powerful influence of Midwesterners, the primary source of our birth and growth, must be understood to truly get Fountain Hills. We could delve into other influences or how those influences created in this boomtown something other than a New York state of mind, but we'll bypass that today. I would like to speak about the ever-transient nature of people coming and going and how it taught me about change while I was also learning about growth. My friends were the children of people arriving in town to start a business or to find a job in construction or real estate. As they moved in and back out of town, I gained and lost lots of friends and classmates.
Michelle, Dee Dee, Jeff, Tracy, and Janine appeared out of nowhere and then disappeared with nary a trace. There were dozens more friends and classmates just like them. As a youngster living with this dynamic, I learned to deal with disappointment and surprise. I learned to take it all with a grain of salt. It was simply a fact of life. Cousins of mine who were born and raised in Kettering, Ohio, never experienced such constantly changing friend lists. The only neighborhood culture I ever experienced inside of Fountain Hills was Fontania One neighborhood next to the elementary school. After mom and dad divorced, mom lived in Fontania One thanks to a friend and realtor named Corky Tomlin and his wife, Joe. Fontania, now called the Villas, was the most dense population base in town. Therefore, it was the only area to which I would call neighborhood. Young working families were there, and that was us. Jason and I spent weekends and summers in Fontania with mom. That was also where the mini landmark, the Little Fountain, once stood. Later, we moved to Fontania too, now called Sawara Woods. The entrance into Fontania One is where another young residence, resident died on a motorcycle. Sometime around 1978, he struck a big eucalyptus tree. We lived only a few buildings away. These tragic motorcycle deaths were well noted by all motorcycle enthusiasts in town, and this was the evil Knievel era, so we're talking serious motorcycle enthusiasts. Fountain Hills Elementary School, with its, with its ball fields, playground, classrooms, and multi-purpose room, enhanced the area of town as a cultural, social focal point. Scout meetings, music lessons, and many other activities took place on the school grounds. A one-time motorcycle safety class was held in the desert adjoining the school grounds where the Boys and Girls Club now stands. I attended. Though my family wasn't much of a restaurant-going family, several of the local restaurants do linger in my memory. Naturally, they would have been social centers for residents in town. I have already mentioned Little John's. Here are just a few more that played a qu quick role in my life. The Que Bueno, now owned by the Sanchez family, right over here. Tibor's Hungarian Restaurant, now Messenger's Mortuary. The Fountain Mountain Inn, later called the Silver Stein, Russo's Market, which is now a bike shop, and the Little Cafe. I'll bat bypass personal anecdotes about those restaurants, however, I will share a photo of Applewix. Applewix was another important place in my young life. It was on the pad where Circle K now stands, on the corner of Saguaro and Shea. Mom and stepdad Eddie had their wedding reception at Apple Wicks. A polka band played at their reception. A couple of young youth dances were held there too. Apple Wicks burned down one day while I was at high school. As an elected fire board member, dad was there that day to support the firefighters and took that photo. Working in construction and development. As children, Jason and I spent hours in the truck with Dad driving all over the dirt roads and picking up nails at our construction sites. That was the beginning of our work outside of home. <clears throat> Fetching tools and stacking things neatly was also commonplace. One of my memories of that early era of childhood was when a big storm hit town. It was night. Dad got word that a downburst hit the 505 area. People called it a tornado back then. We had one or two houses under construction in the 505 area, so we got in his truck and zoomed out in the darkness. The Yoder houses under construction were basically okay, but another contractor's partially built home was a shambles. All on the ground, broken sticks of two-by-fours were strewn about in the neighboring desert. We dodged a bullet that night. A fun aspect to growing up in a developing town is that place names and topographic features on planning maps and in common usage in the early stages of development are sometimes changed, dropped, or otherwise fall out of common use. Speaking builder language, Dad taught us that Plat 505 is in the back part of town in the Boulder and Richwood Drive areas. 
a handful of years after starting our company, Grandfather Fred, Uncle Glenn, and Dad bought out Reed Jewett. The name of the company changed to Yoderbilt. Not only did Yoderbilt build homes all over town and in many neighboring communities, but we also lived in many of the homes that we built. The first we lived in also served as a model. That meant from a very early age, Jason and I were required to keep our room neat and orderly so that the house would show well. By the time I graduated high school, our household had lived in four different homes within Fountain Hills. In each case, we moved because we sold the home in which we lived. My grandparents had resided in at least four different homes. Uncle Glenn had had about four different homes. And Mom lived in a few places, too. The upshot is that Jason and I came to know the town very well. But perhaps most importantly, we brothers grew proficient in the work of moving furniture. <laughs> As the business became more prosperous, we were able to have a model home which was not the house in which we lived. It was while working at our model on Pinto Drive that Uncle Glenn met his future wife, my Aunt Judy. They married when I was a senior in high school. Aunt Judy then joined Ramona, Dad, and Grandfather in the Yoderbilt office, then on Colony Drive. By the time I was 12 years old, this is them, by the way, the main group, um, posing for Christmas, I, uh, at Christmas time, my grandmother in the red there on the bottom right. By the time I was 12 years old, I had done extensive manual labor. Shovels, rakes, and picks for digging in the rocky dirt and caliche were all too familiar. Dad, Ramona, my brother, and I had cleared our yards, planted grass and shrubs, and did most of the landscaping ourselves. Naturally, we were introduced to using saws, hammers, and a few other useful building tools as well. In 1979, stepmom Ramona gave birth to brother Matt, as I mentioned earlier. This photo was uh, taken shortly thereafter at my grandparents' yard on Mangrum Court. 1979 was about the time dad started putting elastomeric roofs on the flat roofs of the homes we built. Jason in fifth grade and I in seventh grade were taken to a roof where dad set us to work. We prospered at sweeping and cleaning the roof, nailing cant strip and putting the base coat on while dad also worked with us. He trained us on everything from how to climb ladders to how to clean dirty roller pads so they could be utilized again. Speaking of utility, he also taught me how to lift and carry full five-gallon buckets of roofing material up a ladder, alternating a bucket in the right hand and then one in the left hand so that I could get equally strong on both sides of my body. <laughs> I was, at the time, impressed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, too, and Lou Ferrigno. That way, uh, at his younger age, Jason moved buckets on the ground, or once they were on the roof, he would move them around on the roof. Later, he carried them up the ladder, too. Back at the Yoderbilt storage yard, we kept the 55-gallon drums of roofing. By age 12 and 14, Jason and I had mastered how to carefully tip 500-pound barrels and move them out of the back of the box truck onto a hydraulic lift and down onto the platform. Once the barrels were positioned on their sides, we pour out roofing into five-gallon buckets, load them into the pickup truck, and head off for the job. We filled many hundreds of buckets that way. On one job, we were re-roofing a townhome, and I stepped on a weak spot. One leg fell through the roof to my thigh. Fortunately, it was on the eve, so my foot didn't penetrate the living room ceiling. Another plus, I didn't fall off the roof. Driving for work. <clears throat> Fountain Hills has always been a good place to learn how to drive. Even today, with 25,000 residents, the wide boulevards and roads lend themselves to new, anxious drivers. Dad taught me about motorcycles, cars, and trucks. He taught me how to ride a motorcycle, but it was Mom who taught me how to drive. The day I turned 15 and a half, Mom took me over to Glenbrook Drive. We switched se seats, and while stopped, I reviewed the shifting pattern on her manual Nissan Sentra. I learned to drive that day. <coughs> Excuse me. 
That summer we drove to Ohio to visit Granny and I became quite comfortable with motor vehicle operations. That's why I was able to jump right into Yoderbilt's C-50 truck that same summer. Mom had taught me how to drive standard transmission and Dad wanted me to drive that truck for work. Excuse me. <clears throat> Am I doing okay? <laughs> trying to move, trying to move. There were a couple of instances while attending Coronado High School in Scottsdale where I needed to drive the C-50 to school. Certainly the only Coronado student to use a C-50 to get to school. <laughs> At dismissal, I drove the rest of the 30 miles into West Phoenix. There was the warehouse containing three barrels of Conklin, a mass elastomeric roof coating I needed to transport back to Fountain Hills. That was quite some responsibility for a 13, 17 year old, sorry. Making the trip one day while driving over the Salt River Bridge from Scottsdale into Tempe, the two left rear dual tires came off the C-50 and passed me by as I skidded on the left rear brake drum. It was only by the skin of his teeth that a motorcycle rider going the other way wasn't hit by one of the hundred pound wheels. <clears throat> Though shaken, I scraped the truck around the corner into Rio Salado Parkway. The loose wheels were on either side of Rural Road in the bike lanes on the bridge. After securing them in the back of the truck, I walked down to Rural and University Drive to find a phone and make a collect call to the office. 45 minutes or an hour later, I was picked back up at the truck. It was towed to the tire company, which had failed to properly tighten the lug nuts, servicing it a week before. <clears throat> Other labor. There was other notable work I did through the years of growing up in building and construction. The summer before ninth grade, Dad took me out to a home where we'd just broken ground. He introduced me to his two guys, lifelong concrete men, Spike and Carlos. I could tell how long they'd been doing concrete work when I shook their hands. Shaking their hands felt like shaking a brick. I learned to smoke cigarettes from Carlos, who ch chain-smoked unfiltered camels in 102 degree summer heat. He didn't provide me cigarettes other than maybe one as a gag, but I made him a role model for smoking. I only smoked for a handful of years, thankfully quitting before graduating college. That concrete job involved lots of shoveling out footers, cutting, bending and tying steel rebar, carrying stem forms, shoveling wet concrete and cleaning tools. Spike and Carlos finished the concrete and I got very strong. It was hot, heavy, dirty work to which I had no right to say no. Pay was $5.50 per hour, I think. That day, I, the day I started high school, my hands also felt brick-like and I was as strong as any 135-pound freshman. <laughs> On weekends and holidays from high school, Jason and I often had Yoderbilt work to attend to. We would do roofing work or rubbish removal from homes under construction. It's an unending job to keep a job site clean. Dad drove us to the Salt River landfill to dump rubbish. Once I started to drive the big truck, Pops was able to stop making dump runs. Driving the company. Uh, meanwhile, my brother Matt is just at home playing with toys. <laughs> Driving the company's C-50 afforded additional opportunities to earn money. Many of our customers, normally retired couples, needed a moving company to move into their new Yoder home. Stepmom Ramona would suggest they hire me to move them. Mentioned earlier, this is where all the experience with moving the family's furniture came in handy. Needless to say, most retired couples don't have much confidence in a couple of teenagers uh, moving their furniture around. The customers were delighted. 
<clears throat> but they would be reassured, I'm sorry, that although we were young, we were experienced movers. I always had my brother Jason or a friend help make the moves. At age 17, we had already been hired to move several households into their homes. The customers were delighted, if not taken aback, at our strength, careful handling of their furniture, and our efficiency. I even remember moving a piano or two. Movers pay was better than concrete or roofing work. Residents and co customers gained trust in me and would offer other work. House sitting or home watch is a notable example of more work that came my way as a result of working in the family business. At seven or eight year, years old, I got my first job watering plants in somebody's first in front yard. During the summer months, they would leave town. <laughs> My parents arranged for me to water a handful of outdoor plants for them once or twice a week. That's when I learned to master the art of correctly rolling up a hose. <laughs> By the time I was a senior in high school, many customers had turned their house keys over to me so that I could check the security of their homes once every week or two. They were on vacations or in their summer homes in other parts of the country. Their trust in me inspired a deeper sense of responsibility. Our young lives <coughs> involved much work, much responsibility. But the result of so much work is empowering because it taught me self-respect and money management, a critical key to developing independence. Another benefit to all the work was friendly association with many of our long-term subcontractors, like Bob Travis back there, our architect, <coughs> whose design features are found throughout Fountain Hills and real estate pros. Again, that must wait for another day. Spending money. Jason and I were always pay paid fairly for the work we did for the family company. We had to closely track our hours and turn in time cards weekly. It was sometimes necessary to remind us of basic economics when we ever asked for a raise. You're only worth as much as it costs to replace you. <laughs> Over time, as our ability grew, we did get raises, but only in accordance with the laws of market economics. The money we earned was used for our life in high school and some of it was saved for college. After much pleading, Dad purchased a used Yamaha YZ80 motorcycle for me when I was 10. When he presented it to me, he also gave me a ledger book for accounting. Every week I would pay him two and a half or five dollars. We would log that in the ledger and each sign our names. Thus began my history of money and debt management. I had to pay for the motorcycle. Unfortunately, the ledger book is now gone, but I'm fairly certain I paid off more than $100 of my debt. At the time, we lived on Carmel Drive, right in the middle of the picture there with the grass that I had to mow. <laughs> Uh, Golden Eagle Boulevard was not paved and there was a motocross track where Golden Eagle Park was built many years later. It had jumps and berms and everything I expected in a dirt motorcycle track. Riding out there was fun. Later I blazed up dirt Golden Eagle Boulevard on Dad's Yamaha YZ360 going well over 60 miles per hour. Racing across the levees in the back part of town was also a thrill. Though I generally rode alone, there were many other teenagers riding dirt roads and trails around town. Hotel Hill on the north side of the Fountain Lake was a motorcycle, jeep, and sand rail destination. A friend, that lady's brother right over there, drove me straight up the north side of Hotel Hill in his sand rail. Off of Grande Boulevard, the remnants of those trails up the hill are barely visible today. Dad purchased a lightly damaged 1972 Chevy Nova from Aunt Charlene at 14 years old. A new ledger book section was dedicated. Payments began for the car that would be mine at 16 years old. 
In the meantime, Dad and I replaced the radiator. He taught me as we took much of the top end of the engine apart for review and cleaning. The mystery of the internal combustion engine was solved. Carburetors, pistons and valves, manifolds, thermostats, the alternator, hoses and belts, etc. are familiar to me because of Dad's lessons with my Nova. Charlene's loss was my gain. That Nova was a great car. Then my other brother, Jason, who couldn't be here today, crashed it. <laughs> Further education. By sixth grade, I noticed that other than mathematics, school was easy for me. Libraries and bookstores were always of great interest. I had developed self-discipline in listening to teachers and mentors. Scott Carver was our PE teacher that year, and he started a running club for interested kids, and I entered a couple of 10K races. My memories of the other teachers in Fountain Hills Elementary School are good. A few of them stand out even today. Mr. Darby, Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Stevens, and Mrs. O'Hara with her hair trigger eraser throwing were a fine bunch. <laughs> It's probably fair to say that I later adopted some of Bob Darby's classroom ways in my own career as a teacher. Peggy O'Hara never threw an eraser at me, but it was exciting to see her express herself at a classmate or two. <laughs> Mrs. O'Hara lived in a Yoderbilt home. Mrs. Rosenthal taught me music and singing. She also sponsored a bowling league and drove my many friends and me to the bowling alleys on Saturdays. Mrs. Green, English literature, and even the librarian, Mrs. McQuiston, a retired Air Force, uh, are all memor memorable. The cafeteria ladies, Mrs. Rice and Mrs. Kometz, I believe, were also favorites. They treated me well by giving me seconds and sometimes third helpings of food. School ended in Fountain Hills with eighth grade. This is my graduating class, and it had about 50 students. Many of my classmates and I had played on numerous school sports teams together, especially in those middle school years of sixth through eighth grade. We'd also played in the same school band and sang in the school choir. For the half of us who'd been together for at least several years, that intimate environment made for close friendships. When I look at that class photo today, however, there are nine classmates I cannot remember. <clears throat> Here you're looking at my eighth grade promotion photo. High school in Fountain Hills. <clears throat> in 1981, high school for Fountain Hills students was in Scottsdale. There wouldn't be a high school in my hometown until the early 1990s. That meant we were bused to Coronado High School in South Scottsdale. Students here today can elect to go to high school in Scottsdale, but we had no choice. Huge rains and flooding had catastrophic impact on the students being bused to Mesa's High School in 1979, so the Fountain Hills Unified School District moved Fountain Hills High Schoolers to Scottsdale. That change may, meant not having to cross the Salt River on the way to school. Insurance against future floods. Coronado High School's enrollment was about 2,500 students my freshman year. That number was nearly equal to the population of my hometown. The important point initially is that I went from being a well-known and respected eighth grader to being one of about 120 other Fountain Hills nobodies who attended Coronado. During freshman and sophomore years, I was active on campus. Ken Fett and I made the Coronado baseball team. Ken had been a teammate on earlier Little League teams. I played third base, was a top seed on Coronado's tennis team, and was a rookie swimmer on the varsity team in those first two years. I sang in choir as well. It became difficult for me to maintain interest in school sports and extracurriculars. The academics were easy. However, the fact that the activity bus didn't return to Fountain Hills until after 6 p.m. caused work opportunities to be lost. We lived so far away from school. My approaching 16th driver's birthday was near, and that would require me to work so that I could fund fuel and other automotive necessities. The cancer death of my stepdad, Eddie, there in my sophomore year threw a temporary monkey wrench into my perceptions of an interest in school. Mom was grief-stricken. 
And finally, I was becoming subconsciously aware that living so far from high school would mean always being considered a social outsider by associates who lived around Coronado. All that said, the four years as a Coronado Don were rewarding. Those were good times, even if after evenings out in the late night drives back down two-lane Beeline Highway could be dangerous. Daily travel up and down Beeline may have been dangerous for us, but we teenagers didn't much think or care about it. That was best illustrated on the day I picked up the realtor Fred Pulvey's daughter Renee to take her to high school one morning. Fred nor his wife Michelle knew about the arrangement. Renee was 14, legal driving age in Wisconsin for those on farm tractors, I believe. <clears throat> since, we were, since we were friends, I offered her the Nova's wheel. After turning onto Shea Boulevard, we pulled over and switched seats. Never having driven before, Renee drove over the old cattle guard on Shea, down Beeline. She giggled as she drove all the way to Scottsdale. She was so short, we had to move the bench seat all the way forward, my knees banging on the glove box the whole way. On Thomas Road at Pima Road, we switched seats again, and I drove us the rest of the way into Coronado's parking lot. 25 years later, I admitted that deed to Fred Pulvey when I ran into him at the local hardware store. <laughs> he smiled and graciously added, thanks, Tim, you did a good job teaching Renee how to drive. <laughs> it is interesting to consider how we teen, teens became familiar with Scottsdale and how that added pizzazz and additional adventure to our coming of age. Fountain Hills kids had the best of both worlds then. Though we were outsiders, we were also insiders in Scottsdale because we went to school there and socialized there. Movie theaters, malls such as Los Arcos, Fiesta and Paradise Valley, concert venues, a trampoline park, and other amenities suited our interests. Meanwhile, Fountain Hills' is Joe Goyena, a realtor for MCO and a father of Joe and Kim, sponsored a youth group for hometown teens. It, this was about 1984. I remember gathering many times with 15 or more local friends and acquaintances in the Fountain Hills Times building on Enterprise Drive. That was a fun social club. Two of those people are married today, yeah, my good friend Ken and Candy. At graduation in 1985, more than 200 Fountain Hill students were riding Fountain Hill school buses to Coronado. There were also many students who drove themselves to Coronado on a daily or near daily basis, just as my three best buddies and I did. Fountain Hills, forward operating base. When it came to free time, weekend fun, parties, and adventure, my friends and I took full advantage of the natural environment surrounding Fountain Hills. The town had less than a fifth of the number of current residents, so there was ample open space for activity of all kinds. Access to mountains, rivers, and lakes was wide open, and the neighboring Verde River in Fort McDowell was accessible as well. We were hardy upperclassmen with jobs, automobiles, and initiative. Four to eight of us would get a few basic necessities together, put on our cut-off jean shorts and old shoes, and drive out to Saguaro Lake to jump the cliffs. It was easy to spend a few hours jumping and swimming. Here are a few of my best high school buddies and I on our last trip together to the cliffs. We had a few mishaps here and there. Once or twice a friend tried something daring and with the false sense of powers a couple of beers can create in a teenage boy ended up in some danger in the water. Our overall dedication to each other made it so that in the end, minor scrapes, bruises, and temporary insults to reputation were the only evidence that remained of said foolish decision. 
There was one weekend when the lake parking lot was full. It may have been Memorial Day. We were so dead set on jumping the cliffs that each day, uh, that day, that we made our own workaround. We drove the two cars to Butcher Jones Beach where we unloaded the two full coat coolers and then we hiked them up over the mountain and accessed the cliffs from the north. There is no trail for that in the steep and treacherous terrain. The four of us guys were going to be seniors. One girlfriend, Emily Brown, was going to be a junior, and the other girlfriend in our group, Michelle Oliva, was going to be a sophomore. That was our clique. Tradition, tragically, Emily passed away from cancer in her 30s, our first best friend to pass on. Tubing the Salt River has also been fun for people from the Valley of the Sun. From 1983 through 1985, we tubed the Salt River many times. Floating boom boxes blaring the hits of the day were numerous. During those lively teen years, the now destroyed cliffs which stood on the river near Blue Point Bridge were a highlight. But my favorite thrill action on the river, other than the girls, was the guy wire that stretched over the river. Accessing the wire cable from the cliffs at Blue Point, I hung on, moving hand over hand 30 or 40 feet so that I dangled above a deep well in the river. The drop into the river was about 20 feet. Too many fatalities in that area of the river caused land management to destroy the outcroppings that were the cliffs, thereby hindering access to the guy wire. In the mid-1980s, we Fountain Hills teens had more fun in the river than the teens do today. The Verde River was the nearest source for water fun. As an eight-year-old there with family, I unknowingly dived into the shallow water and hit a sandbank. The summer after ninth grade, a friend named Tracy Rains and I impulsively decided to walk to the river. We walked the two miles with no water. Drinking from the cool waters of the Verde probably saved my life that day. During our junior and senior years in high school, we held parties at a place on the Verde called Six Poles, which is about a half a mile from the confluence of the Verde and the Salt. We also did riverboarding in that area. Mountains surrounding Fountain Hills also played prominently in my life. As a 10-year-old, our scout troop decided to hike to Phantom Ranch in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. To prepare for that journey, our troop did an overnight test hike and camp up four peaks. I remember parking the vehicles not far off of Beeline Highway and hiking up the dirt road for a couple of hours to a, school, a cool spot in some greenery. There we camped. We went pretty far up the four-wheel drive trail on that western face, I think. The first time ascending Camelback Mountain was as an adolescent. Mom's brother, Uncle Paul, took Jason and me. The three of us also climbed what is now called Piestawa Peak shortly thereafter. Red Rock, also called Red Mountain, was a challenging conquest as a 17-year-old. Red Rock is on the Salt River Pima Indian Reservation I know now. Back then, we didn't know anything about that and probably assumed the monolith was part of state land. To get up Red Rock to the top of the nipple takes some patience and some physical and technical ability beyond simply walking up a trail. There was no trail. It's steep and has sheer cliffs and a crevasse that drops 100 feet or more. Here are two photos from my final ascent. One contains a few fellow climbers. Adding danger and yet more thrill to our energetic Fountain Hills lives, we learned that there were mines, long abandoned yet active spelunking destinations in South Mountain in Phoenix. On at least two different evenings, four of us Fountain Hills buddies drove down to Phoenix on a Friday night. One pal knew where the entrance to one of the mine shafts was located, so we parked nearby. Candles were our only light source on one of those dives. My good friend Ron Gutierrez took a frightful fall in that mine. It was a forgotten moment until a few years ago, Ron casually credited me with saving his life. Ron remembered falling onto a beam below which was a pitch black pit of unknown depth. I helped Ron to safety that night. 
Since Yoderbilt also constructed a few homes in Payson, that area also hosted our team cadre. We camped along Houston Mesa Road, made a one-of-a-kind night hike to Pine Creek under Tonto Natural Bridge, which is part of another short story of mine, and otherwise enjoyed the pines of Payson a few times. We also shared in many local adventure shenanigans. Fountain Hills has a distinction of being certified as a dark sky community. Considering the quiet solitude of our town's dark night sky today, imagine how dark it was in 1984. There were many teen parties, desert parties, in and around town. It was always a cat and mouse game to stay clear of the deputies of Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. They were good policemen who always were decent to my friends and me. Nevertheless, we did our best to avoid them as they did their best to uphold the rule of law. The desert offered some notable places to rendezvous and socialize and steer clear of the authorities and our parents. The top of the world was one. So-called because of the topography, the top of the world is even popular today, though you will not find teenagers tending a bonfire there. From Fountain Hills Boulevard, we took the Palisades towards Shea. Palisades became a two-lane dirt road where today's high school is. Up the big Palisades Hill we drove, passing only a few houses on the frontage road. After passing El Lago and then Thistle, we turned off the dirt palisades right onto a trail which led up a steep hillside. We simply drove up that trail a few hundred yards and stopped and had a party right there on the top of the hill. Today, the Adero Canyon Resort stands on that spot, the top of the world. That was one of our rendezvous points for desert parties. Work for the family company took me all around town, so it was easy to find other locations where we teenagers could gather away from prying eyes. Small groups of five to 15 of us gathered at the following places to socialize. In the desert where the middle school parking lot is, on the corner where Four Sons gas station now stands, that corner didn't become busy until Palisades was connected to Shea many years later. Behind the levee on the road to the Dixie Mine, in the desert west of Rio Verde Road, about two miles past the middle school, and in the middle of Saguaro Boulevard, on the other side of Shea, about a half a mile beyond the sheriff's substation. I figured, let's party in their neck of the woods. They won't be expecting it. Not my best decision. <laughs> The deputies and town posse members tracked us well. Sometimes we were too loud, of course. Visible bonfires, loud music, or trash left behind gave us, gave us away. So we always had to find new places. We also started hauling off any trash we might create. And now, the fairs and fountain. Thank you for being patient. In remembering coming of age in Fountain Hills, art fairs hold a prominent spot. I can't swear to the start date for those attractions, but I know that they were happening in 1976. The art fairs were fun because they gave excitement and culture to an otherwise real estate and construction village. Thousands and thousands of outsiders flocked here to buy arts and crafts during those fairs. Those yearly fairs helped teach me about the many forms of arts and crafts. Today, of course, many superb artists call Fountain Hills home. One annual fair was called Eight's Great Fair, after sponsor KAET Channel 8. It featured hot air balloons lifting off from the northwest corner of the Fountain Lake. Since Dad and Uncle Glenn loved flying, the hot air balloons were a must-see. The colorful behemoths rose from the fountain lakeside, sometimes dipping their gondolas in the lake before rising into the air. And I'm not exactly sure the source of this photo, but I do know that my grandparents took a ride in one, and this could have originated from them, I'm not sure. <coughs> 
the centerpiece fountain is tied to so many memories. As the fountain was originally filled with fresh water, my first memory is of our great Dane Zeke walking in the lake while Jason, Mom, Dad, and I were on the east side of the fountain lake having fun. Moments later, while running in the grass, Zeke undercut Jason from behind and Jay went flying into the air. He was four and I was six. Excuse me. <clears throat> A few more pages. During some of our early Independence Day celebrations, I remember many people wading and swimming in the fountain lake, especially along the western side of the lake facing Saguaro Boulevard. Speaking of Independence Day, Dad and Uncle Glenn were two of several guys to organize and run the Fountain Hill's first 4th of July fireworks display in 1974. The fireworks production receipt and Dad's handwritten notes as to organization, fireworks safety classes, and costs are still in our possession. We also have an exploded steel mortar tube used to launch those fireworks. There was a malfunction that evening as fireworks were being launched launched. The firing team, including dad and uncle, was lucky to have avoided injury. And there's the mortar tube right there. And my uncle just informed me today that he was the one that dropped the charge in that blew up. One of the great experiences in our history was Independence Day 1976. I remember cowboys riding horses and cannons being fired at the Fountain Park with what seemed like a hundred thousand people. Excitement over the bicentennial ruled the entire summer. The Bazaar was the name of the building at the fountain which housed a gift shop, Kay Kinder's clothing store and an Indian jewelry store, I believe. Much smaller, it stood where the fountain shops stand today. The only bathroom at the fountain was on the south side of the bazaar. No sidewalk encircled the fountain, no playground, no splash pad, no veterans memorial, and no disc golf course were to be found. One of the most surprising things I ever saw happened at the bazaar when I was nine or 10. My friend, older than me by a few years, had heard through the grapevine that a local young woman was going to streak around the bazaar. <laughs> she was going to win cash if she did so. It was a holiday, I'm pretty sure, because hundreds or thousands of people were set up all over the park. John and I scooted excitedly over to the bathroom area on the south side of the bazaar where the action was set to commence. To my memory, there were about 20 local young people clustered in the area, 30 feet from the woman's bathroom door. I was the youngest present to view this bold anti-establishment act of defiance and rebellion. The cute young woman surrounded by her local uh, female bodyguards came out of the bathroom and walked over to one of the guys. She said to one dude, you better pay up if I do this. He showed her the money in his pocket. She and her deputies walked back into the bathroom. All the while a festive energy and lively activity was all around us. Outsiders were oblivious to what was about to happen. Like a rocket, the stark naked girl burst out of the bathroom, sprinting around the first corner of the bazaar. Here's that photo, Lisa. <laughs> One of the many who tried to follow her, she was the fastest runner I've ever seen. <laughs> Sorry, Usain Bolt. We doubled back and saw her make it back to the bathroom unhindered. She dressed and collected her money right then and there. Just a no another ho-hum streaker of the 1970s who still lives clearly in my memory only 44 years later. <laughs> As adolescents, we played pickup games of tackle football in the drainage swale north of the bazaar. Despite some minor injuries, it was really fun, especially in the mud after a good rare rain. We played baseball on the old ball diamond in the northeast corner of the park. It was there that our championship senior little league team did much practicing. On a sad note, I recall a tragic day at the Fountain Lake. If memory serves, a Memorial Day or Fourth of July Fountain Lake swimmer 
got too close to the fountain's pump station when it came on. The impeller power was too strong and the person was overcome and drowned. It took the sheriff's dive team to extricate the unlucky soul from the underwater filter grate in the pump station bay. K.C. Evans, that lady's mother, the mother of one of my best friends, was uh, an organizer of the world's largest delivery order of White Castle hamburgers. There were hundreds of thousands of burgers delivered to Fountain Hills in a refrigerated big rig originating somewhere in the Midwest. That delivery order set a Guinness world record and was a great promotional event in the early years of Fountain Hills. The Lone Ranger, Clayton Moore, came to our school as part of that promotion. I'm not sure what he had to do with hamburgers, but <laughs> <clears throat> even though a frivolous lawsuit legally prohibited him from wearing his mask, his big sunglasses gave a decent approximation. It's here again where I'm forced to bypass the tale of the secretive, highly elite, and renowned Shamrock Society and the monster formerly known as Nessie. It was about 1980 when a young local deputy in training was attacked at the fountain. He might have been a member of the local civilian posse. It was said that he was addressing a group of young Fountain Hills people roughly his same age who were drinking or partying. Hit in the head from behind, the trainee was knocked unconscious. The perpetrator was never apprehended, I believe. That was some news. Speaking of news, did I mention mom and stepdad Ed Straka married in the clearing on the north side of the fountain? The breeze was beautiful and light and the sky was filled with cotton ball clouds. Here they are with our preacher, Glenn Atchison. The fountain was a getaway place for teens in high school. Throwing frisbee there one day, friends and I met a guy named Jeff Burns. Jeff always seemed to be at the fountain with a disc in his hand and a smile on his face. He talked passionately about disc golf. Jeff was the driving force behind the Frisbee Disc Golf Course at the Fountain, I believe. It's a disc course that has since drawn national attention to Fountain Hills. Just as do dozens before us did, my girlfriend and I took a blanket down to the park. Billed as a picnic, such teen outings are often meant more for kissing and snuggling. Somewhere on the old trees on the north side of the Fountain Park below Hotel Hill might be the remnants of a pocket knife scar reading TY plus MO. About 16 years later, I climbed up the fountain's flower structure in the middle of the lake. The lake had been emptied during an ongoing works project. Like a swimming pool might be replastered, the lake bed was going to get a new liner. A service road runs from near the present day Veterans Memorial to the concrete fountain structure, just a couple of feet below the standard water level. Standing at the base of the structure, a three-step ladder was visible. Hanging between the fountain's protruding concrete flower petals, my fingers curled around the bottom rung seven feet off the ground. Pulling myself up and climbing the ladder, I stepped onto the graded platform under which the huge spotlights rested. Hovering over me was a concrete cup, akin to the cup of a daffodil. Only there did I appreciate the enormity of the structure. 15 to 20 feet tall from the lake bed to the top of the concrete flower cup. It's hard to imagine standing on the shore of the water-filled lake. Returning from college after first semester, I saw the fountain in a different light. Rising over us for 12 years as a youngster, I had often taken it for granted. A new appreciation for it was born on that Christmas break, a magnificent and beautiful piece of art and engineering, a monument designed to define the heart of town. Conclusion. With the passing of time and an aging mind, childhood memories become ever more muddled. I am very grateful for being raised in this beautiful and vib vibrant boomtown of Fountain Hills, a member of one of the original pioneer families. Thanks to my family's business, I even played a small part in the building of the town. 
In our first 12 years, Fountain Hills grew 20 times the population it was when we first arrived, a modern boomtown. Growing up as we did in Fountain Hills reinforced my optimism and taught me important values, many of which are the essence of my character. Independence, adventure, honest work, responsibility, and relationships all have become a part of me. In 1973, my brother and I were accessories to our parents' dreams. Ultimately, Jason, Matt, and I became accessories to their success that success being the town of Fountain Hills. Thank you for listening.